California moves into a new phase in the pandemic, which the governor has uh, named Beyond the Blueprint. So all of those colors, those tiers, the yellow tier that we've been celebrating the last six weeks, um, all go away tomorrow. And most of the business uh, and industry guidances also will go away. Um, many restrictions will be lifted, including capacity limits, physical distancing limits and requirements, and some face covering requirements, especially for vaccinated people. Um, so vaccination has really changed the course of this disease. Santa Cruz County is one of the best performers, the least impacted by disease in the state right now. And California is one of the best performing states in the nation. And again, thank you to the dedication and cooperation of this community. We're much safer from COVID-19 than we were at any other time in the last year. Uh, we've been living under a shifting set of rules for a long time. And there's many lingering beliefs about what the rules are. For example, sometimes we still see Appendix A up in store windows, and that has not been in effect for many months. I was out and around in uh, throughout the county this week with out-of-town visitors, and I saw lots of signs uh, that said that, uh, for example, drinking fountains were closed or bathrooms were closed by order of the local health officer. And that is not at all the case. Um, I want to remind you all that I've had no local orders in place for many, many months now, including local face covering orders. Um, we've been aligned with the state uh, throughout the process, but with no additional orders for many months. And uh, the state is aligning with the CDC. So we're hoping that in the coming days and weeks and months, um, the message will be clearer as we've learned more about this virus. But unfortunately today, the messaging is still somewhat confusing. Just prior to beginning this press conference, Governor Newsom sent out a tweet saying that he would be placing an executive order on Thursday that would uh, place uh, the Cal OSHA workplace guidance in effect on Thursday. We don't know which version of those Cal OSHA emergency temporary standards he is planning to put into place. There have been three different versions in the last two weeks. So um, time will tell. So today we're not going to be able to say a lot about workplace guidance. Um, other than the Cal OSHA guidance that's been in place since December. So the emergency temporary standards from December are currently what's in place and that will be in place at least for the next two days. Um, that's all I can tell you about that. California Department of Public Health has posted their new face covering guidance. Uh, they posted that toward the end of last week. Uh, it goes into effect tonight at midnight. And um, in addition, there's a posting uh, about California Department of Public Health moving beyond the blueprint. And it does reference several other guidances, including travel guidance that's been in effect since April 2nd, and that will remain in effect for the foreseeable future. Um, the, that travel guidance says that vaccinated people may leave the state and leave the country and return without quarantining, fully vaccinated people that is. Um, partially vaccinated or unvaccinated people are still required to quarantine for a full seven to 10 days upon returning home, seven days if you are um, testing and 10 days if you're not. So that's for unvaccinated or partially vaccinated people who've left the state or the country. Um, so we're going to continue to monitor our local disease transmission and our testing numbers, um, but the tier system will go away. Um, so we will no longer be having tier Tuesdays. I hear we're still going to have one tomorrow where we will get our metrics um, just kind of to 
to close that loop. Um, but we've been in the yellow tier now for six weeks, um, not expecting that to change. And we're seeing no indication that our numbers are trending any differently than they have been, which is um, happily very much downward. Um, some limited restrictions remain with the blueprint beyond or beyond the blueprint guidance from the state. Um, these are mostly around what the state calls mega events. So that means uh, for indoor settings, crowds larger than 5,000. And I don't think we have any indoor settings in Santa Cruz County um, that can hold uh, greater than 5,000 people. So that would apply to if our residents were to travel to other jurisdictions that do have those. For example, the Monterey County Convention Center does hold over 5,000 people. Uh, outdoors mega events are 10,000 people. Um, so that includes things like marathons, um, endurance sports, um, uh, concerts, uh, other festivals, fairs, uh, those kind of things. Um, and I'd refer you to the CDPH website if you want rules around mega events. Uh, with the exception of workplaces, face coverings are no longer required for fully vaccinated Californians in public settings, except in certain circumstances. So those include healthcare settings, including skilled nursing facilities, long-term care facilities, any building with uh, healthcare offices. Um, in addition, public transit, uh, so airplanes, ships, ferries, buses, taxis, and all those terminals, transportation hubs, all require face coverings worn by vaccinated and unvaccinated. Homeless shelters, emergency shelters, such as fires, cooling centers, and any detention facilities, so jails, juvenile hall, um, prison settings. Um, indoor in K through 12 schools, in childcare settings and other youth settings. Um, the CDC will be updating its guidance in this area and school guidance will be updated over the summer. For now, through summer school, uh, K through 12 schools and childcare are required to follow current industry standards. In the settings where masks are required only for unvaccinated individuals, um, operators of private businesses can do any of the following. Number one, they have the option of asking patrons to verify their vaccination status. That would be a picture of your vaccination card or the actual vaccination card or an other, another document from their physician. Um, they also may inform individuals of the rules and ask vaccinated patrons to self attest their vaccine status, or they might require all patrons to wear masks. Uh, a very important point of the new face covering guidance is that no person can be prevented from wearing a mask or be made to wear a mask as a condition of participation in any activity or entry into a business. So those who feel more comfortable wearing a mask, regardless of vaccination status, they may do so in any setting. Um, some businesses and organizations may continue implementing infection control measures, including masking. In most cases, at least for now, employees will be required to mask, whether vaccinated or not. And we're asking everyone to please respect local businesses that choose to continue taking these additional measures, including asking vaccination status or requiring masks. It's their choice to do so. And as I mentioned, uh, the current workplace rules from Cal OSHA that went into effect in December are in effect at least until Thursday, uh, perhaps longer. And so anything that you're doing at work now, you're still required to do. And then I also want to take a moment to remember the 270, 207, I'm sorry, 207 community members who have lost their lives to COVID in Santa Cruz County. 
and to their families and loved ones, and also to the many people who lost their livelihoods because of the pandemic. We've all been impacted. It's changed all of us. Recovery will take many years. We especially need to remember our children. A year and a half of interruption of normal childhood development, all of the rituals and milestones that they missed, the educational opportunities, the social support. For our children, this will take a lifetime of recovery. We need to approach this process with the same principles in mind that we use to navigate the pandemic itself. Respect, kindness, compassion, health, equity, and justice. Thank you all as we continue to work to move through this pandemic. And at this point, I'd like to ask Dr. Ghilarducci to give us an update on vaccinations. Oh, thank you, Dr. Newell. And this truly is a, a turning point for us, a real milestone in this uh, devastating pandemic that continues to rage across the, the rest of the world. Um, I'll talk briefly about our vaccination progress. Um, and just to point out um, the importance of that is this is really the reason why we're here right now, because uh, if it weren't for vaccination, we wouldn't be having the success that we're having right now. Uh, we're certainly not out of the woods yet. I'll talk a little bit more about that, uh, but um, but we're making some great progress and, and uh, I think we should be proud as a county on how well we're doing. So with that said, some, some brief statistics here. Um, this is a remarkable number. 73.5% of Santa Cruz County eligible residents have received at least one dose of vaccine, and that's uh, just a tremendous number. Essentially, three quarters of our county has it had at least one shot. Uh, when you count full vaccination, uh, that's either two shots of the mRNA vaccines or one shot of the Johnson & Johnson, we're talking 60% fully vaccinated. And that makes a huge difference in terms of our ability to control this going forward. Um, that said, uh, there's still significant pockets of vulnerability in our county, uh, particularly in younger people who have not yet either had the chance to get vaccinated or those who are not yet eligible to be vaccinated. Uh, and uh, those pockets do resent, uh, represent some risk for us going forward, uh, particularly uh, we think in the fall uh, uh, that uh, we, may see, um, we may see some clusters of cases and continued disease and death. Um, the, um, as far as the pace of vaccinations go, um, one of the things we track internally is our seven-day rolling average. And at our peak, we had hit uh, over 3,200 doses uh, per day on average back on April 20th. That's when we were at our, our uh, top peak. Um, now we're at about 912 doses per day. Uh, so that's uh, you know a third, less than a third of, of where we were. Uh, that's to be expected, of course, that um, the, the people that were most eager to get vaccinated, that group is done at this point, and we still have some work to do. There continues to be an equity mismatch um, that those who um, are um, the, the least advantaged in our community continue to have um, lower vaccination rates, although I will say in Santa Cruz County, uh, we've made some tremendous progress in trying to get some equity there, but statewide that continues to be a problem, especially with younger uh, people who, um, uh, you know, uh, children and young adults who may not have ready access to health care. So, uh, so uh, we're continuing to make great, great progress. It has slowed down. Uh, we still have a lot of work to do. We still have po pockets of vulnerability. And I'll, I'll mention this as well. Um, and uh, including uh, the most recent um, death that we had um, over the weekend uh, was in an unvaccinated person. And so what's happening now is uh, we really have kind of two worlds we're living in. We have the world of those who are vaccinated and who are protected, who can take their masks off, who can really start to live their lives in a normal way. And then we have those who haven't been able to get vaccinated yet for whatever reason. And the risk to that group, that second group, um, is really going up because now they're living in a world where people aren't going to be wearing masks on a regular basis and there's going to be gatherings that we haven't had. And so their risk of uh, serious illness uh, and even death um, are now higher than they really have been before. And that's despite the fact that we've had lower case rates. So, um, so we're going to continue to, um, to push the message that vaccination is good for you and it's good for people that around you that you love 
and uh, we'll continue to be working on those groups that um, have been harder to reach. So um, I think uh, Director Hall may have a few comments, but I'll leave I'll leave my comments at that. Thank you, Dr. Gilarducci and Dr. Newell. I I wanted to um, at this point. It seems like every time we join you, we say we're at a new place or a new point in the pandemic. And today, we're we're looking behind us with all of the success that we've had. Um, but also the loss that we've experienced and we're looking ahead. So one of the things that I wanted um, the public and the media to know is that the, our work definitely isn't over. There are many, many more months of work for us to do. And when you're facing an epidemic or a pandemic, the responsibility of public health is to protect everybody. And as, as you've seen over the last 18 months, the way you protect everybody in a communicable disease pandemic is by protecting the most vulnerable first. We've done that throughout the pandemic. So as we look forward to the next 18 months of the pandemic, it, we have a lot of work to do, and it might be even more difficult work than the work that we've done so far. As um, both of our health officers mentioned, we have clusters of unvaccinated people. And those clusters um, are unvaccinated people aren't spread randomly. They're spread in geographic and social and cultural clusters. And because of that, they create spaces, um, spaces of vulnerability. So we know that going forward, even though most of our population is protected, we're gonna continue uh, what Dr. Newell mentioned was the focus on equity, the focus on justice. And um, we really need to focus on eliminating these spaces of vulnerability to COVID. I wish that after 18 months, we were at a place where we could say the pandemic was over and it is not over. What we've done is we've dampened it so that we're, we're not continually being um, turned upside down, trying to find resources to take care of people on the back end in the ICU or in the hospitals. But this is not the place that we want to live forever. And with variants emerging, um, having the potential to garner our vaccines less effective or ineffective, it's really, really important for us to continue the work that we're doing now. So I guess that's my message to everyone is that um, it's so hard. The reason we have these pockets is because of decades of racism. Decades of racism and inequity have driven people of color to poorer neighborhoods, lower paying jobs. We can't undo that in a year. We can't even undo it in a decade, I don't think. But when it comes to the pandemic, I think that we can all work together to continue our focus on, um, on equity and eliminating inequity. And um, it's not going to be an easy road, but I know that we're all up for it because that we know we know that when we have pockets of disease anywhere in our community, it's a threat to everybody. And again, back to why public health exists, we're here to protect everybody, and the way you do that is to look out for those most in need first. So that's just my message to our entire community going forward. Thank you, Director Hall. We're going to move to the question and answer uh, portion of our press conference. If uh, media who have joined us can raise their hands in their chat window or in their video window, I will go ahead and call on you in order. It looks like our first question is going to come from uh, Tony Nunez. Tony, uh, go ahead. Hi, um, my question is for, I guess for everybody, um, where are we seeing these pockets of disease and, and what has been our approach so far um, to address these pockets? Yeah, Tony, this is Mimi, Mimi Hall. Um, um, when, when I speak, I'm speaking from a national perspective. We often look at what's happening across California as well as across the nation. And um, many other counties aren't doing as well as Santa Cruz. And it really doesn't matter if Santa Cruz is the best or if we're in the top 10, because we don't exist in a vacuum. And um, pandemics are population-wide diseases. And so what the trends are telling us 
is that the maps of um, vaccine vulnerability or lower rates of vaccine are kind of overlaid across those um, lower income and more vulnerable communities in the um, Healthy Places Index um, lower quartiles. And so, you know, it's funny because one of the things that the pandemic has taught everybody to pay attention to is data. And I know that sometimes people get very, very focused on the minutia of the data. One of the things that I wanna remind everybody is from a public health perspective, we also step back and we look at the 20,000 square foot view because we also wanna see the trends. So um, I, I, I can have the health officers talk a little bit about what's happening here, but I think it's pretty clear that our last couple of deaths, um, our deaths are happening in unvaccinated people. And what I predict is that in the future, should we have uh, pockets of disease kind of circulating in vulnerable areas, that um, because people are unvaccinated, what we're going to see is, should we have uh, children who are infected? Um, and should we have hospitalizations of young people or unvaccinated people? I'm going to predict that the trends of those will continue mirroring the trends prior to vaccination, that it's going to be in our Latinx population, it's going to be in our lower HPI zip codes, which is, um, so, so when I speak about data, it's not because right now, today, we have some crazy data showing us, um, although we do have some indicators, our, our um, equity gap is um, increasing a little bit, but it's, it's just the trend that we know it, it exists and it's a force that we have to continue fighting at the local level. Uh, we can't give up. We can't say, oh, we're done. We've done a great job. It's, it's really a continuous effort. I'll give Dr. G or Dr. Noel, do you want to add anything or should we go to our next question? Well, well I, I want to remind folks that uh, vaccine for the win is still in progress and uh, it's not too late to get your vaccines, to get your $50 gift card and uh, have a chance to win uh, a lot of money in uh, upcoming raffles. So um, if that's a motivator for you or if you know folks who aren't yet vaccinated, uh, remind them they can still get their $50 once they're fully vaccinated and uh, have a chance to win along with the rest of us who are vaccinated um, in the upcoming raffles. I was just gonna, um, thank you for that. Um, um, helpful to know. Um, I was gonna add uh, and welcome um, those on the call to uh, take a look at the state website on vaccination progress. And you can see the, as D uh, Director Hall mentioned, the single greatest predictor of uh, vaccination status is your um, is your health equity. And that's a composite of lots of factors, but including income, crowded housing, even uh, the number of trees in your neighborhood, <laughs> oddly enough, all of these are a composite measure of, um, of inequity in our, in our society. And so that's the greatest predictor of, of vulnerability pockets. Great, thank you all. Let's go to Mallory Pickett. Mallory, go ahead and ask your question. Hi, um, my question I think is for Dr. Newell. Um, I just wanted to clarify some of the new guidelines. Um, what, so my understanding is there's no rules on sort of private gatherings like weddings and funerals. I'm not sure, I mean, assuming those are under 5,000. And then also what are the situations where children who are under 12 can't be vaccinated yet that they should be wearing a mask? obviously in school, but other things in the, out in society. Right, so um, unvaccinated folks, so weddings and, and places like that, um, if there's indoors, uh, unless everyone is verified as either all attendees as either vaccinated or um, have been tested in the last 72 hours, um, then unvaccinated people must wear face coverings at weddings. Um, and it's still uh, recommended that if there's going to be music, singing, that sort of thing, that they, uh, that face coverings are worn indoors. Um, so some specific things are still in place around that, but right, no limit on size of weddings and those kinds of events and private gatherings. 
And then it is recommended that anyone unvaccinated, including children between the ages of two and um, 12, 11, that not yet eligible for vaccine, uh, wear face coverings uh, as any other unvaccinated people will. Um, and that includes all of the K through 12 settings, any kind of youth activity settings and childcare. Uh, thank you, Melissa Hartman. Why don't you go ahead and ask your question? Thank you, Jason. Um, I was wondering if you guys had heard anything from business owners that are worried um, that have had issues with building their workforce. Um, that's been something that we've been hearing statewide, nationally. Um, and in terms of how this new Beyond the Blueprint may invite more people to come out that haven't been shopping or eating out, like, have you heard that as a concern that there won't be enough staff? I have. Um, I was out in uh, the county a lot this weekend. I had visitors from out of the area. And uh, so I took the opportunity to speak to employees and employers, business owners when I could. And many of them uh, plan to continue to require face coverings in their businesses and largely uh, to uh, reassure their employees that they're working in a safe space. And um, so I think that's part of the labor shortage considerations is that employees themselves want to feel comfortable in the workplace, uh, especially in a tourist-based uh, community like ours where people are coming from all over the world to enjoy our area. Um, so I think that we're going to see many businesses continue to require face coverings and that is their option. Our next question comes from Tony Nunez. Tony, go ahead. Hi, yeah, um, this is about mask wearing and about, um, I guess, enforcing that. Um, I think Dr. Newell, you said that businesses can, um, according to the new Beyond the Blueprint, either um, ask for someone to provide proof, have them self attest, or that they can re uh, require everyone in the business to wear a mask. But I think shortly after that, you said that a person can't be denied um, entrance to a place with a mask. So I, I'm, I think I'm, a, I think I misinterpreted that, but uh, or maybe it's just confusing the way it's written right now. Um, can you go over that one more time for me? Thank you. Yeah. So a person who wants to wear a mask, a customer who wants to wear a mask, cannot be denied entrance to a business or cannot be uh, given any kind of special treatment if they remove their mask. So there have been reports from all over the state, not so much in Santa Cruz, but uh, in some of my home areas in the Central Valley and other places, uh, there have been businesses that will not admit a person who's wearing a mask or uh, they charge them more or won't give them a discount if they're wearing a mask. And so the new face covering guidance, which is uh, legally binding for the state of California says that businesses are prohibited from doing that. So they can't in any way penalize a person who chooses to wear a mask in their business. And then uh, private business owners can choose to implement uh, the face coverings in whichever way they want to, they can require documentation of vaccination um, for mask status uh, or social distancing status. They can do it by self-attestation or they can require um, everyone to wear a mask, any of those options or no one, either way. I mean, they can also um, just uh, let the customer uh, be honest enough to do the right thing. Does that clarify it? We'll see. I, let's go to Mallory Pickett. Mallory, go ahead and um, ask your question. Hi. Um, my question is about variants, which we haven't talked about in a while. Um, I was curious uh, what sort of results you have, if any, from the state and UCSC lab, if there's been any new variants detected locally, especially the Delta variant is 
one that people continue to be concerned about. You want to take that, Dave? Uh, yeah, I, um, I'm afraid I don't have the statistics on uh, how many we've seen, but we have not seen the Delta variant that's um, otherwise uh, previously referred to as the India variant, the 617. Uh, there's another one, I believe it's uh, Epsilon, it's a 617.1, and the Delta is the 617.2. That one has been a concerning one. Uh, we're seeing uh, at least uh, uh, kind of continued outbreaks in uh, the U and the U United Kingdom due to uh, the Delta variant. And there's some evidence that um, it does um, have, um, you know, uh, more transmissibility. That is, it's easier to pass from person to person with a lower dose of virus being transferred uh, and also uh, maybe some more severe illness. One, one thing that uh, from a vaccination perspective that I found very interesting coming out of the UK was that a, a single dose was not very protective at all from the Delta variant. And I think it was 38%. Um, and then once you had the second dose, it went up into the high 80s. And uh, that is a reminder to those out there who have um, gone to the trouble to get a single dose to make sure you follow up with that second dose. You're not there yet unless you've gotten that second dose. So, um, so we're concerned. We haven't seen it here yet. We know it's in the Bay Area. It's probably just a matter of time, um, but um, uh, it is concerning. Most of the variants that we've seen here have been the B117, which is also the alpha, I believe now, is that correct? Yes, I alpha think that's variant right. is the B117, previously known as the UK variant. And that's the one that we're seeing most commonly here besides the West Coast variant, uh, which is, is that now? I've forgotten which one that is. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, likewise. I had yeah. a chart, but I don't have it up. But uh, Yeah. So, um, um, I, and that's been all that we've seen in the past several weeks. We've only had the B117 and the West Coast variant. Thank you. Why don't we go to Melissa Hartman. Melissa, go ahead and ask your question. I was wondering, um, a lot of the instructions that we're hearing around the new face mask mandates now um, are primarily like the conversations about indoors um, because that's that will have such a big effect. But I'm wondering um, if there are any for like outdoors for highly trafficked areas like the boardwalk, the wharf, um, is there really any risk of you know, transmission, like any anything that would worry you guys going forward into the song. Dr. Lord, is, Dr. G. It is so difficult to transmit COVID-19 outdoors. We know a lot more about this virus now. It's very difficult to transmit outdoors unless you're in very close proximity for a long period of time. So, um, we're not too worried about outdoor transmission. Uh, it's, it is recommended in mega outdoor mega events or other very crowded settings and then required in transportation hubs, even outdoors and uh, the other settings that are listed. But um, in general, we're not worried about outdoor transmission. And my understanding is that children in school settings will not, do not need to wear face coverings outdoors. And I think that, uh, and I, the only thing I would add is um, if the Delta variant becomes predominant, uh, that may change things, um, you know, because there is a chance that it is more transmissible. And of course, you know, your time at the boardwalk is not entirely outdoors. Um, you know, there are indoor aspects, the um, eating areas, the arcade, uh, and so forth. So it's hard to characterize something as purely outdoor or purely indoor. Um, you know, those kinds of interactions can happen. Thank you. Why don't we go back to Tony Nunez. Tell Tony, go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, um, my question is about mass vaccination centers and testing centers. I'm wondering, um, I think around Watsonville, we still have the one in downtown at the old city hall um, in terms of the vaccination centers. And then we also have, I believe the testing center um, over at Ramsey Park. 
I was wondering how long are those going to stick around? And I, I think I did see that the, um, at least the one run through the county, the, the drive-through vaccine center at the fairgrounds is no longer in operation. Although if, if it is, um, you can correct me if I'm wrong there. Uh, but uh, how long are those other centers going to stick around for? Thank you. Our contracts with OptumServe, uh, which is a, a service provided by the state for testing and vaccination has been extended through October 31st. So um, those should be sticking around for a, a number of months more. Yeah, and as far as uh, mass vaccination at the fairgrounds, yeah, uh, we're just because of the slacking of the demand, it doesn't uh, make sense to, to do that. But um, our efforts now are, um, are directed more to targeted um, groups. Um, so we have pop-up clinics in certain areas like the swap meet at the fairgrounds um, is, uh, is one example. Um, also, I think uh, generally speaking is uh, we need to get to the point where, um, where these kinds of activities um, are then you know, taken up by our, our healthcare system, uh, like you know, other types of healthcare. So we will be, you know, um, as time goes by, transitioning more to the traditional healthcare system to do that, with of course continued emphasis and focus on those who have limited access to the healthcare system. And uh, Tony, I just wanted to throw out because we really didn't stop to commemorate the um, decommissioning of that mass vaccination site at the fairgrounds. We had a small ceremony out there with staff, but that was a massive logistical undertaking. And about 20,000 residents ended up getting vaccinated at that site. So I just, I wanna reach out and thank everybody that was involved in planning and executing that. That was a tremendous effort. Um, Mallory Pickett, why don't we go to you for our next question? Um, I wanted to just follow up on a couple of things that we talked about earlier. Um, the if the B117 is here now, um, that's new since we had last heard about variants. So I was just sort of curious when it first started showing up and kind of what proportion of cases it is now. Um, and then finally, just a clarification on Tony's question way back at the beginning. I think he asked about if there were clusters of disease here in the county. Um, but I was curious because I think Director Hall had been had also talked about clusters of unvaccinated people. Um, so since there aren't really geographic clusters of disease right now, are there any geographic or demographic clusters where the vaccine hasn't reached? So sorry, they're two very different questions, but I hope you can answer them. <laughs> Mallory, I'll provide some clarification on my statement for your second question. Um, we're not tracking exactly who's unvaccinated in every census tract or zip code, but what I was referring to is what we know from a public health perspective is that it's not random. And there are things that drive vaccination status, just like other things, and those are the social determinants of health. So our anticipation is that we know that there are still people unvaccinated and um, we're, we're drawing some conclusions based on what we know about health behavior and other diseases that, um, that these don't exist like in single little individual spread everywhere that they likely are um, mapped, overlaid with our healthy places index with our most vulnerable communities. I can um, maybe add a little bit more about pockets of unvaccinated um, looking at our demographics. And uh, it's interesting, um, you know, we, we had a huge focus on uh, South County for a long time, making sure that there was adequate access to vaccine there. And when we look at um, the, um, I would say like the 40 year olds and above, uh, we're essentially equal across all three sections of the county, North, Mid and South. And that's fantastic. But what we're starting to see now is more of a mismatch in the younger group. When you get to the 39 and below, um, roughly uh, countywide, roughly 50% of that group that's eligible um, has not yet had a shot. Uh, but when you get to the South County, um, that goes up to 60 and 70% who have not yet had a shot. So uh, we're seeing some equity mismatch, mismatch uh, at least geographically South County um, uh, down there. And so we're gonna need to continue to work with uh, pediatricians and family physicians 
uh, on making sure that kids um, get vaccinations for COVID. There, of course, are other vaccinations that have been held off over this past year that we also need to catch up on. And, uh, you know, things like measles, mumps, rubella, uh, polio, et cetera. And so all of those are, are super important that we get people caught up. We have some, um, um, some catching up to do from just the regular stuff. And I'll add that one of the things that we've been doing to target that young adult group, so they're, you know, we're looking at the lower vaccination rates in those 20 year olds, those 30 year olds is um, working with employers and offering employer based um, vaccine pop ups. It's something that um, we think is a win win for the workplace to keep your workplace safe. And if you're one of those employers that tend to have a lot of those um, younger adults in their 20s and 30s working. Um, so when when Dr. Newell or Dr. Gillarducci talked about pop-ups, that's um, one of the methodologies that we're using. And employers can look on the county website to, um, to register for one of those. And I'll just jump in and give a plug for that. So if you're an employer and you wanna set up a workplace vaccination clinic for your employees, just email HSA C19 vaccine clinics at santacruzcounty.us and just give us the name of your organization, your preferred contact information, and the number of employees. Um, why don't we go to Jeremiah? Jeremiah, go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, yeah, thanks. Um, Dr. Gilladushi said earlier that it's only a matter of time until we start to see more variants circulating in the community. And I guess I wonder what license you have to impose restrictions again, if there are outbreaks, maybe even among vaccinated individuals with weaker immune systems. And um, if there's a, a threshold there for what, what would have to happen before we return to some of the restrictions that we saw earlier in the pandemic, if, if they're necessary. Yeah, thank you for that question. You know, uh, it's, um, it's hard to imagine that um, sort of countywide or even statewide uh, restrictions um, are going to have much effect on pockets. Um, really, what we're going to need is a more targeted approach going forward. That said, uh, and I'll use the UK as an example again, is they found the need with a, a resurgence uh, of uh, this Delta variant kind of being coming widespread. They're actually overtaking the B117, the Alpha variant, uh, that they needed to impose some. Um, uh, you know, uh, population-wide restrictions again. Uh, we hope that's not going to be necessary here. The UK did uh, have a different kind of vaccine rollout than, than we did. Uh, this is the reason I mentioned the one-shot, two-shot effectiveness against the Delta, is that the UK had uh, tried uh, everybody get a one-shot first and they'll worry about the second shot later uh, strategy, which um, could make sense. But in the case of the Delta variant with the low effectiveness um, with just a single shot uh, of keeping people out of the hospital or keeping them from dying. Uh, unfortunately, that I think that strategy probably wasn't as good as, as our strategy in the U.S. where we um, wanted to get people completed in their vaccination series as quickly as possible. So, um, so yeah, hard to predict. Um, I think that uh, any local restrictions um, that do happen are going to be in conjunction with state um, guidance and state orders because what happens in Santa Cruz is likely happening elsewhere. But uh, Dr. Newell is ultimately responsible for that, so I should allow her to elaborate if she wishes. Well, uh, California Department of Public Health leadership has indicated that we would likely move back into the tier system. Uh, so either the very same system or uh, something very similar should the need arise. So, uh, and they're watching disease rates closely. And the things that they look at are things like ICU availability. So if we were getting to the point where hospitalizations increased and our ICU beds would once again um, become close to capacity, um, those would certainly be indications that we needed to be more restrictive again and um, it would be something similar to a system where we've been in the last few months. Thank you. Why don't we go to Melissa Hartman? Melissa, do you have another question? Go ahead and ask it. Yes, thank you. Um, I was wondering whether we had had any unvaccinated, or I'm sorry, vaccinated, not unvaccinated, 
uh, people pass away from COVID-19 or related um, conditions since vaccine access became widespread. Um, I know that we've talked, I think at least the last two or three were unvaccinated people. So I was curious, I kind of wanted to get that background. Yes, I'm happy to report that uh, we have not had any hospitalizations or deaths in people who were fully vaccinated. In Santa Cruz County. And, and Melissa, I think there was an NBC did a big story about while there are people still dying and showing up in hospitals, by and large, they're all unvaccinated. Um, so get vaccinated. Mallory, do you have a question? Yeah, I just wanted to follow up. It was my fault for asking a multi-part question. But uh, on the B117 variant, um, when did that first show up and what's the sort of proportion of cases if you have that on hand? Go ahead, Dr. Newell. Um, we saw our first B117 uh, variant as soon as we started checking for uh, whole genomic sequencing. So. I believe that was probably back as far as March. Is that about the time when we started doing genomic sequencing here in Santa Cruz County? And um, uh, other than the California variants, which I looked it up, it's Epsilon. So the two in uh, India are Delta and Kappa. And the, the West Coast or United States variant is uh, the uh, B1427 and 429, that Epsilon. Um, we've had a lot of those, um, as expected, and then just a handful of B117s, and I believe we had one P1, and um, that's it. No deltas or kappas yet. But uh, I, I, did, I did read that uh, it's expected that delta will overtake alpha, as it has in the UK um, over the next come over the coming months, two to three months. Yeah, and, I, and I think, Mallory, you'd asked if there were um, pockets of these variants, and um, that's difficult uh, given the low case rates that we're talking about um, and um, kind of uh, uh, small sample size of those that actually go on for genomic sequencing. So uh, I can't say that we've seen um, the variants show up in any particular social groups or geographic groups at this stage. Uh, the numbers just aren't big enough for us to make that kind of analysis. Other jurisdictions have. So uh, Marin County and Santa Clara County each had a uh, significantly sized group of folks with Delta variant. Uh, they included people who had recently traveled from India. Uh, Tony Nunez, do you have another question? Please go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, get some, just to make sure I heard the right thing from Dr. G. I think he said that 60 to 70% of those 39 and under in South County have not had their first shot. And I just want to make sure I heard that correctly. And then also I saw that um, the chief of public health, Jen Herrera was on the call as well. And I was wondering if I could ask her how, um, or now that we've had, I think maybe a month of the pop-up shops down here, in, or not shops, but um, locations down here in South County at farmer's market, farmer's markets and so forth. Um, just uh, are we seeing success there in um, are people coming around and, and getting their vaccines at, at those pop-ups? Thank you. Yeah, uh, Tony, uh, as far as the percentages, yeah, I'm just looking here. Um, so uh, when we get to the 12 to 20 year olds in South County, we're, we range from 27 to 44% have had um, at least one shot. Um, and then if you go to uh, North County, for example, uh, those numbers go up to, uh, my computer's refreshing, sorry. Uh, those numbers go up uh, at least 10 points higher in both categories. So there's definitely a mismatch um, in those younger groups uh, between um, North and South County. And regarding the pop-up clinics, I would say that they have been successful. Uh, with pop-up clinics, neighborhood-based clinics, tailored vaccine immunization programs, those are, it's multiple names for the same thing. It's basically being really targeted or specific with how you focus the vaccination effort. And part of the goal at that point, when you're focused on a very specific population, is not so much throughput. Of course, we want to see many numbers 
the vaccinated, but it's also engagement with the community and the individuals who are getting vaccinated. So um, from that perspective, it's been very successful. It's been a way to engage with the community, answer their questions about vaccines, especially in South County where we're hearing a lot of misinformation and um, um, just just lies around uh, vaccine efficacy and safety. And to be able to um, have a presence in areas like the swap meets and be able to talk with people one-on-one -on -one, um, in an informal setting and answer their questions around uh, vaccinations has been really helpful with promoting vaccine, building vaccine confidence. Um, in addition to that, we've been, uh, we have been seeing a steady number of individuals getting vaccinated at those sites. We learned today that the UC system will move forward with requiring vaccination of all of their students, faculty and staff and contractors, anyone who will be on campus at all for any reason. Um, regardless of the uh, emergency use authorization. So they are not they are not waiting for full FDA approval. And so it's hoped that the CSU system will follow suit and other employers as well. We have another question from Melissa Hartman. Melissa, go ahead. Thank you. Mine is just a follow up to Tony's question. Do we have a ballpark figure on how many people have been vaccinated at the pop-up sites? We don't right now um, because we are not the only organization who is doing pop-ups. Um, we are certainly connected with other organizations, um, other healthcare systems that are doing pop-ups, uh, but at this very moment, I don't have that number offhand, on hand, excuse me. I will say that at the fairgrounds, uh, the swap meet clinics, we've been doing um, approximately about 40 vaccinations um, uh, every Sunday since we started, and um, we started on Mother's Day. Great, thank you all. Seeing no more questions, I think we're gonna conclude the press conference. Thank you for joining us. Uh, good luck everyone tomorrow. And thanks once again for your persistence and patience and cooperation throughout the last 16 months or so. Thanks. <laughs>